<laughs> this is a journey into sound. A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new values, and a new experience. Welcome to the Geese Spot Podcast. I'm your guide, Katie Silcox, bringing you your weekly self-love sound bites. Join us for conversations around sex, spirit, and all things self-care. All things self-care. All things self-care. This is a journey into You are a G-Spot podcast with Today's podcast is brought to you by yet another group of incredible women-owned business gals, Pavani Ayurveda. That's P-A-A-V-A-N-I, Pavani Ayurveda. I went to Ayurveda school with them. It's so fun to see these women that I was in school with opening up these amazing businesses and they're coming to you from Northern California. They make the most beautiful artisan lines of, of little batches of pure organic Ayurvedic skincare products and other products as well. But I, I use their products every single day for, for sure. Um, they're handcrafted. They make them in, in these very loving little batches with mantras. Um, so, you should definitely check out the link in our show notes if you are looking for amazing products with amazing ingredients. And the cool thing about their website is they give you um, really kind of hand-tailored uh, awareness around what skincare products might be right for you and your particular dosha, which is awesome. They help you create your own ideal skincare line using plants and minerals and love. And I love their stuff. Really great, um, complete face care products. So check them out. And we're going to be featuring them all month. I'm going to be talking about Abhyanga rituals and skincare rituals and what Ayurveda has to say, which is a lot about how to take care of your skin and revive your skin. It's incredible what Ayurveda can do to rejuvenate and restore. So check out the link in the show notes and you'll get a special link from us that will give you some Ayurveda love. So check that out. Hey, beautiful people. Katie here with a really interesting topic that I get asked about a lot. I, um, you know, I'm from, it's, if you're a listener of the podcast, you now know that I am a Southern girl. I was raised in the Bible Belt. I was raised Southern Baptist. I spent my whole life going to church. We went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And after church on Sunday night, we would go across the street at Fellowship Chapel in Bristol, Tennessee, or Virginia. I'm not sure which it is. Um, Bristol is where I grew up and um, we're actually on the border of Virginia and Tennessee. So, you know, you never know if you're in Virginia or Tennessee when you're in that city. But I grew up, I grew up going to church and, and my neurology is so wired for Jesus. You know, I just, just saying the name Jesus and I feel my whole body just vibrate with so much sweetness and so much love and, and it hasn't always been that way. You know, I, I like a lot of, I'm, I think I'm a Gen Xer. And then I have other people tell me that I'm a millennial. Um, I was born in 1980. And, and so I kind of walk that line, but I definitely Google things and, and live on my iPhone and um, have a lot of the characteristics that uh, millennials have. But I know many of you listening to the podcasters are millennials and, and many of you are Gen Xers and hopefully some of you are baby boomers. And, and, I, and I know that we all share in common this feeling that um, many of us who grew up Christian, that that particular form or expression of Christianity, just there was a moment in my life when I went to college and um, it just didn't work for me anymore. And a lot of people who um, have come to yoga it, tell me, you know, it was the same for me. Um, and it's not just people who anecdotally that I've heard of who come to yoga. Um, surveys and statistics show 
that many young adults right now perceive evangelical Christianity um, and Christianity in general to be too political and too exclusive of people that, you know, we really love and care about. Um, there's a, there's a fundamentalism and an exclusivity that I grew up with, um, that said, you know, if you don't accept Jesus, then you're going to hell. And that was something that I bumped up against in my twenties, you know, even in my late teens, that just was not going to work for me. And it was really hard for my family, especially my mom. And, you know, that, that sort of old fashioned, um, form of Christianity was not going to groove with my newly found understandings of social justice and meeting and, and loving many people who were gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender. It, it, it just didn't work. And so research is showing now that young Christians in our country um, ha- kind of come up against that same thing I came up against where it feels like you have to choose between the religion that you grew up with and your intellectual integrity. And, and, and that's a really horrible place to be where you have to choose between your, oftentimes your family and your faith and your culture and your community and, uh, your intellect and science. And, um, for me, yoga, right? Like everything I was learning about, um, expansion and open mindedness and open heartedness and compassion and, universality and the perennial philosophies of mysticism, it just wasn't vibing. And so um, I think a lot of, especially women come to yoga because we're really seeking wholeness. We're seeking a spirituality that our upbringing may not have been able to fully give us. We're seeking um, a mystical oneness, right? And yet, and so we come to yoga, right? And I moved to India and I, and I studied yoga fervently, almost obsessively. And I moved to India and I studied with A.G. and Indra Mohan in their home. And one of the coolest things about being with A.G. and Indra, who are my just such beloved people in my memory, was how loving and kind these two beings were. And you could just feel the decades and decades of their meditation in their body when you were with them. And I remember it makes me cry thinking about this. I remember sitting with A.G. Mohan, and and, I, and we need to send this podcast to him because um, I, I remember sitting with A.G. and he's so freaking funny and and jolly and kind. And I just remember that the energy of A.G., was so Christ-like. And I remember thinking, this dude is one of the most Christ-like people I've ever met. And if it says anything about, uh, let me just say this. If, 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 if I feel this way about AG, double that, and that's how I feel about his wife, Indra. Just these most kind people. I mean, he would, before, before they would eat a meal, they would go outside and feed the dogs and the birds and the little children that would come up to their door because, you know, in India, little children, if you have some money, they're just hanging out uh, beside your house. And so Indra and AG would literally feed the poor children and the, the birds and the dogs before they themselves would eat. I mean, if there's, there's anything more Christ-like than that, I, I don't know what is. And so it, I was just really conflicted because I grew up, I grew up, you know, evangelical Southern Baptist. And, and, and so it was like this conflict because a lot of the, especially when I lived in Tennessee, the church that we went to was actually non-denominational and um, the preacher's name was Lester. And Lester was like basically my grandfather. I mean, my dad didn't know his dad and Lester was my father's father. And Lester would come over to our house every other week and we would go talk to Lester after, after church on Sundays. And and Lester was this loving Christ-like man that that really really informed a lot of my my upbringing, and, and so I had a conflict, right? Because on one hand, I loved my religion, and 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 it informed me in so many beautiful ways, and I loved Jesus, and I had accepted Jesus into my heart, 
And on the other hand, I, I knew that Mohan and Indra were Christ-like and were leaders on this planet in the proliferation of the energy of love and Christ. And what I loved, and so it was like this huge conflict, right? And so I, I obviously chose to, to move towards um, inclusivity and yoga and you know, and, and I, as a, as a young woman often does, or a young man, I, I decided I'm not a Christian anymore and I want nothing to do with Christianity. And I wrote a blog actually that I'm going to read to you guys because when we launched our new website, this blog post didn't make it onto our new website, but we're going to put it up before we launch the, the podcast you're listening to now. So it'll be up, but, um, this is one of the single most popular blogs I ever have done in my entire writing career. And it was all about how I really had to reject Christianity. I really had to um, be angry at Christianity. I really had to be angry at the preachers, some of which I grew up with in Roanoke that, and, and like the youth ministers and the weird wacky shit that they did. Like I had to get angry about that and I had to bring that to light. But now, right. Um, I I have to, I have to actually forgive them and I have to actually forgive what I see as misknowing avidya, right. This misunderstanding that exists in the Christian faith right now, in my humble opinion. And in that, now I'm able to come back to Christ and, and Christ is uh, the Ishtadeva that I, one of them that I work with. And Ishtadeva is your personal connection to spirit and Christ lives in my heart. And that energy of Christ consciousness, that is the vibration of, of true love. It, it, it's a huge part of my spiritual practice now, but, it, but I really had to go through um, a, a strong rejection of it. And you may be in the place where you have rejected the religion of your ancestors. And, and I'm not here to tell you what to do, that's for sure. But I do want to share a little bit about my journey because um, I do think that there is something powerful in the words of A.G. Mohan that he said to me when I sat at his feet in Chennai, India. And I said, Mohan, you know, I really want to, I want to connect to God and I want to learn meditation and I want to learn Tantra and I want to learn yoga um, what do I do? You know? And he said, yeah, I learn meditation and learn yoga, but just, just connect with and worship the gods of your ancestors. And at the time I remember thinking that's preposterous, Mohan. Um, you don't, you don't obviously, uh, sir, you obviously don't understand like the gods of my ancestors are not cool. Like they're the gods of my ancestors are telling me that, um, you are going to hell. Right. And now as a more mature, hopefully somewhat wizened in some ways, woman, I I see the wisdom in what he was saying because the gods of my ancestors live in my body. And it's up to us to revive the essential meaning of what the gods of our ancestors were, were putting out into the world. And, and, Christ is the God of my ancestor. And I feel so honored to be a part of this new wave of young people and millennials on the planet right now who are, who are offering up their version of heart-based Christianity that absolutely loves all people that actually takes, um, take, does not take the word of the Bible literally. And who also are contentiously arguing that, the version of Christ's message that we received that we received is is perhaps not the message of Christ himself that the bible itself was um at least the version that we have only one small version of the story and often taken by men po- who had political desire and was contorted and used to be able to control people and if you actually read the words of Christ, and if you go back and you read the, the Gnostic texts, which were found, these Nag Hammadi texts were found, I believe, in the 30s and then kind of proliferated in the 60s. Don't, don't hold me to that date. Um, you see that the Gnostic texts are actually incredibly um, tantric, that the lost books of Thomas and Mary Magdalene are very tantric texts. And so you may be wondering, can I be a tantric and can I be a Christian at the same time? And 
The answer is absolutely yes. The beauty of Tantra is that whatever works is Tantra, right? And so like if you sit down in the morning and the thing that gets you going is the goddess Kali, wonderful. If you sit down in the morning and the thing that gets you into that energetic of higher self, of spirit, of vibration is Christ, wonderful. And you may be a wild woman who needs all of them and, and you like to dabble in, in both worlds and and have many um, avatars and spirits and, and gods and goddesses on your altar and at, at your, I don't want to say at your disposal because we certainly are at their disposal. But what I'm trying to say is that the beauty of Tantra is that the definition of Tantra is whatever works, right? Whatever it is that works, that gets me into an expanded state where I'm able to move beyond my sense of limit and beyond my sense of karma and beyond my limited mind and beyond my limitations and enter into the truth of what is actually happening right now. So, um, this, this sort of, uh, schism that we're that that we're experiencing in 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 at least the united states but i think all over the world is is asking christianity to evolve and to mature and to rectify in some ways um there's also this evangelical christian obsession with sex and so i think a lot of us are also questioning that i certainly have in the past and and, and we're wanting to step into a reality where we can experience the mystical love of Christ consciousness and at the same time honor our sensual, sexual nature. One of the biggest problems that I had and have with Christianity is this um, uh, repetition of the fact that your body is worldly and bad. And so to be able to, to, to move out of that belief system into a world where what if your body is the creation of God? And what if everything God creates, God creates in love and for love? And that the worldly is the most exquisite expression of the creator. And this is the essence of Tantra, that the underlying nature of the world is beauty and, and bliss. And that the divine creates us to celebrate our bodies and to celebrate our sexuality, to celebrate our sensuality. And there really are no rules around that. Um, so I think that's something that Christians are really rubbing up against and no amount of edgier music in, you know, Christian worship services. There's nothing wrong with that, but that's not going to fix this sort of inquiry that we're having. Um, at the same time, I think w for me, you know, it was like, I'm, I wanted to reject, uh, Christianity because of all the m millions of obvious reasons why, but it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And so now I've really come back to being able to, to merge those two things. And it's such an amazing thing. Um, this is, this is a, a beautiful conversation that I'd love to hear your thoughts on. And if you're, we'll post on Instagram and Facebook. If you're not our Instagram follower, it's, Katie Silcox underscore the Shakti school on Instagram. We'll put links to that in the show notes. Join us and comment on this post. We'd love to hear your experience with merging yoga and Christianity if you have them. Um, and so I want to end the, I want to end the today's show by reading this most single, most popular blog post that I've ever put out in the history of putting out blog posts. Um, I wrote it, uh, let's see, 2013. So six years ago. Um, and so some things have shifted, but I, I think it's funny. I think it's fun. And I think it speaks to this returning and this forgiveness practice and this compassion practice. And oh my God, and in a world guys where our country is so divided and our, and our world can feel so divided and people, people are marching in the streets and screaming at one another, which you know, there's good things that can come from this activism and this, but I think in this world where we just feel so black and white to, to be able to actually love our enemies and forgive one another and to hold one another is the greatest message of Jesus. And I just invite Christ into my heart right now with you. And I invite the energy and the consciousness of Christ's love into my words. And I invite you to maybe question what what the gods of your ancestry, whatever that may be, 
whatever that may be. I'm speaking from my experience in my life, but to question what what is it from the gods and goddesses and experiences of my ancestry that needs healing? And how can I be that one, that one who has been called and chosen to forgive the, quote, sins of my father, to forgive the wounds of my ancestry, and to take what was wonderful and beautiful about my experiences and my ancestors and bring that into this new age? That's what I ask you to, to do today. So without further ado, I'm going to read you guys the old blog from six years ago, um, what real deal Christians taught this yogini about love and forgiveness. Yoga mat carrying chicks could learn something from Bible carrying chicks. I should know. I got schooled by some sassy suit wearing lady preachers this past year when I moved back down south to Virginia, land of the notorious Bible belt. A few months back, I had a big old fat case of poor me's. A mind gremlin had actually wrapped her slimy webbed palms around my head and my heart. This mind gremlin was ruthless, loudly blaring things into my heart space that made me want to give up on my dreams and get in bed with a box of Chex Mix and a block of cheese. Luckily, my mama Vera was around to pull me out of Funk City, dragging me kicking and screaming to a Bible study. The last time I had been to a Bible study, I was wearing MC Hammer pants, braiding friendship bracelets, and listening to Tony Braxton. Needless to say, I was less than thrilled at the prospect of revisiting that awkward time of my human embodiment. I demand it, Mama said. You are coming with me to my little Bible study. My mom always calls her calls it her little Bible study. It's as if adding this little diminutive qualifier to the whole charade, she can somehow fool all these other non-Christians, a.k.a. me, into overlooking what clearly proved to be a Jesus-y, tantric, Christ-worshipping lady witch gathering, complete with scented oils, speaking in tongues, and the laying of hands. Little my ass. There is nothing little about my mama's Bible study. Not only are most of the women buxom and juicy women, but the unapologetic spiritual dexterity and prayer-filled dedication of these Jesus-loving ladies made me wonder if we yogini gals had a few things to learn from them. Let me explain. About halfway through this Bible study's lesson on faith and surrender, it became obvious to the group that I wasn't sharing much, an oddity for me in any lady group circle, let me assure you. With much trepidation, I admitted to the group of women that I didn't feel comfortable sharing and connecting with them because I could feel myself holding so much pain and anger against the Christian church. What are you angry about, said the leader lady, a no-nonsense woman with a loving matriarchal tone. I'm angry that a bunch of middle-aged Southern men made me feel so bad for being me, for being a sexual, sensual creature, for being a woman. I'm angry that the eight, at the age of 13, I had to sign a promise card stating that I would, I would never have sex before marriage, that I would go to hell if I did. I'm angry that I was subjected to lock-ins at the age of 14, where me and my Jewish friends that I had invited were shown graphic lo-fi videos depicting non-Christians' eventual resting place the fiery lakes of Satan's teeth-gnashing hot wonderland. I was angry that I was stuffed full of Krispy Kreme donuts and Mr. Pibb throughout that lock-in, and at a hazy, sugar-drugged 3 a.m., asked whether or not I wanted to be a child of God or not. I was so angry and even sad that the single most intimate aspects of who I was, my body, my sexuality, and my personal connection to my divine creator was co-opted by a patriarchal religious system that was so afraid of my vagina that they wanted to keep it on lockdown through prepubescent pseudo contracts and fattening me up on donut cream. As I finished my tear stained rant, the preacher woman stood up and came over by my side. She put her hands on my head. And I closed my eyes as she entered into some sort of Christ-loving lady trance. I felt my heart soften as she touched me. Lord, she said, please free Katie, this daughter of yours, 
from the burden she is carrying, O divine love. Lord, may all the thoughts inside Katie that were placed into her by these men in bad suits and bad haircuts be removed from her right here and right now. We know, Lord, she prayed, that she is your sacred jewel, your most beloved possession. Lord, we know that she was created by you in perfection. May all these thoughts and feelings she has inside of her that tell her she's damaged, that she's dirty, that she's shamed, may they be removed from her right here and right now, O Lord. This child of God is a light for your love. This is how you see her, O Lord, and this is how we see her. Please, God, let her see herself in this way from here on out. As she continued praying and laying hands on me, I felt the storehouse of years of 13-year-old girl sadness and angst leave my body. I felt relief knowing that there was a group of women that embodied Christ's non-judgmental love and acceptance. With my eyes closed, I felt my whole body fill up with light, tears streaming down my face as I let this woman of God, midwife and exorcism of the thought forms that the Southern Baptist charade had mistakenly planted into my body. But they weren't done. Slowly, as the tears streamed down my face, each of the women in that little Bible study came over and put their hands on me. I felt safe knowing that these women loved me exactly for who I was as they cried out, Amen, and whispered, Yes, Jesus. I felt healed. I was being healed by the mamas of the Christian realms. I felt the whole wily band of Christ's cheerleaders placing their loving mama hands on the wounds that had wrapped themselves on my heart like dark tentacles. But Jesus apparently wasn't done with me yet. The leader lady actually got down under the tall table on hands and knees in her sleek black lady suit and anointed me and my feet with oil, just like I'd read about in those old school Bible times. She anointed me with oil. What a fearless woman. She put oil on my feet, praying that I may be protected wherever I walked. And then she put oil on my hands, saying that my hands would act as servants of love in this world. She put oil on my forehead, saying that my mind would be a clear vessel for Christ's love. And then she looked up at me and I opened my eyes. And I'll never forget the question she asked me. Katie, now do you forgive them? Do you forgive those men in suits? Can you forgive the church? of your childhood. Wow. She was asking me to be the forgiving one while I was waiting on justice and restitution and rectification. And I wanted my anger to be uh, redemptive and righteous. She looked at me and asked me to do what I think Christ would ask me to do. Can you forgive the ones that you feel have betrayed you, have harmed you? She was asking me to do what Jesus Christ would have done. She was skilled at her craft, and the truth is I was ready. Yes, I whispered. And I did forgive, and I am still probably forgiving and forgiveness keeps washing over me like a cool river, like love. It's never over. It's a process we continually come back to. Forgiveness. And then feeling it again. Feeling the anger. Feeling the hurt. And then forgiveness again and again and again. Those women that day at that little Bible study, my mama's little Bible study, acting on behalf of the love of Christ, taught me what it means to be saved. Being saved isn't a one-time thing. It's something we have to do again and again. And that day I got saved, saved for the second time. Not like the first time when I was little, where I may have felt fear and coercion and childish innocence, but that day I was saved out of love and forgiveness and the power of women when they gather together as a group and they hold one another and 
hold space for pain. I was saved from the memories that lived in me of how bad Christianity had been for me. I was saved from all that anger that I was carrying around, my God, like a, like a heavy backpack. I was saved from myself and my own limited view of what it means to be on the real deal spiritual path. I was saved from that limited sense of self that told me I knew what I needed. And that what I needed was to hate the church. My Christianity today may never look like my parents' version or the church's version or the or even the version of the wild group of Christian lady, which is at that Bible study. But what I do know is that I am a guardian of love, chosen by Christ to continue to forgive and love, forgive and love, forgive and love. And that is how Jesus is alive in me. And that's how my mama's little Bible study went down. To conclude, here's what I learned from those real deal Christian mamas that day. First, they aren't impressed with the political and economic use of Christianity. They are impressed by acts of great trust and love. Lots of cool Christian women and men are not happy with the way things have been going down in the Christian church. That real deal preacher woman told me that oftentimes it is the very leaders of religion that are closest to the devil himself. I knew that, but to have a preacher woman say it to me healed my heart. I learned that prayer is something Christians go to. They go to often, like every day, and it helps them support one another and themselves. These ladies are praying for one another on the daily. When was the last time we sat our hot yoga tone booties down and prayed for our friends and our family and ourselves? Maybe we could start being fearless enough to do that for ourselves and selfless enough to do it for one another. Circles are good for study. These women got together weekly to do deep study of sacred texts like the Bible. When was the last time yoga girls got together and dug deeper into the sutras or Rumi or any tantric texts? We can learn so much from our Christian sisters. We should gather in circles. We should talk to one another, not in our yoga voices that we use in yoga classes, but in our vulnerable, real deal voices. The voice that we have that our friends from high school would recognize. The Bible says that when two or more are gathered in God's name, love appears. Real deal Christians are doing the same thing that real deal yogis or Buddhists or Hindus or Jews are doing. Call yourself whatever you want. The end game is the same. It's love. L-O-V-E. I hope you have a beautiful day, and thank you for attending this little love chat at the Key Spot. Put the pull.